Tuesday was today, and I had meant to meet him tonight. I turned over the paper. This never came by post. How did you get it? I would rather not answer that question. It has really nothing to do with the matter which you are investigating. But anything which bears upon that, I will most freely answer. She was as good as her word, but there was nothing which was helpful in our investigation. She had no reason to think that her fiancé had any hidden enemy, but she admitted that she had had several warm admirers. May I ask if Mr. Ian Murdoch was one of them? She blushed and seemed confused. There was a time when I thought he was, but that was all changed when he understood the relations between Fitzroy and myself. Again, the shadow around the strange man seemed to me to be taking more definite shape. His record must be examined. His room must be privately searched. Stackhurst was a willing collaborator, for in his mind also suspicions were forming. We returned from our visit to the Haven, with the hope that one free end of this tangled skein was already in our hands. A week passed. The inquest had thrown no light upon the matter, and had been adjourned for further evidence. Stackhurst had made discreet inquiry about his subordinate, and there had been a superficial search of his room, but without result. Personally, I had gone over the whole ground again, both physically and mentally, but with no new conclusions. In all my chronicles, the reader will find no case which brought me so completely to the limit of my powers. Even my imagination could conceive no solution to the mystery. And then there came the incident of the dog. It was my old housekeeper who heard it first by that strange wireless by which such people collect the news of the countryside. Sad story this, sir, about Mr. McPherson's dog, said she one evening. I do not encourage such conversations, but the words arrested my attention. What of Mr. McPherson's dog? Dead, sir. Died of grief for its master. Who told you this? Why, sir, everyone is talking about it. It took on terrible and has eaten nothing for a week. Then today, two of the young gentlemen from the gables found it dead. Down on the beach, sir, at the very place where its master met his end. The words stood out clear in my memory. Some dim perception that the matter was vital rose in my mind. That the dog should die was after the beautiful, faithful nature of dogs. But, in the very place? Why should this lonely beach be fatal to it? Was it possible that it also had been sacrificed to some revengeful feud? Was it possible? Yes, the perception was dim, but already something was building up in my mind. In a few minutes I was on my way to the gables, where I found Stackhurst in his study. At my request he sent for Sudbury and Blount, the two students who had found the dog. Yes, it lay on the very edge of the pool, said one of them. It must have followed the trail of its dead master. I saw the faithful little creature, an Airedale terrier, laid out upon the mat in the hall. The body was stiff and rigid, the eyes projecting and the limbs contorted. There was agony in every line of it. From the gables I walked down to the bathing pool. The sun had sunk, and the shadow of the grey cliff lay black across the water, which glimmered dully like a sheet of lead. The place was deserted, and there was no sign of life save for two seabirds circling and screaming overhead. In the fading light I could dimly make out the little dog's spore upon the sand, round the very rock on which his master's towel had been laid. For a long time I stood in deep meditation, while the shadows grew darker around me. My mind was filled with racing thoughts. You have known what it was to be in a nightmare, in which you feel that there is some all-important thing for which you search, and which you know is there, though it remains forever just beyond your reach. That was how I felt that evening, as I stood alone by that place of death. Then at last I turned and walked slowly homewards. I had just reached the top of the path when it came to me. Like a flash, I remember the thing for which I had so eagerly and vainly grasped. You will know, or Watson has written in vain, that I hold a vast store of out-of-the-way knowledge without scientific system, but very available for the needs of my work. My mind is like a crowded box room with packets of all sorts stowed away therein. So many that I may well have but a vague perception of what was there. I had known that there was something which might bear upon this matter. It was still vague, but at least I knew how I could make it clear. It was monstrous, incredible, and yet it was always a possibility. I would test it to the full. There is a great garret in my little house which is stuffed with books. It was into this that I plunged and rummaged for an hour. At the end of that time I emerged with a little chocolate and silver volume, Eagerly I turned up the chapter of which I had a dim remembrance, 
Yes, it was indeed a far-fetched and unlikely proposition, and yet I could not be at rest until I had made sure if it might, indeed, be so. It was late when I retired, and my mind eagerly awaiting the work of the morrow. But that work met with an annoying interruption. I had hardly swallowed my early cup of tea, and was starting for the beach when I had a call from Inspector Bardell of the Sussex Constabulary, a steady, solid, bovine man with thoughtful eyes, which looked at me now with a very troubled expression. "'I know your immense experience, sir,' said he. "'This is quite unofficial, of course, and need to go no farther. "'But I am fairly up against it in this Macpherson case. "'The question is, shall I make an arrest, or shall I not?' "'Meaning Mr. Ian Murdoch?' "'Yes, sir. There is really no one else when you come to think of it. "'That's the advantage of this solitude. "'We narrow it down to a very small compass. "'If he did not do it, then who did? "'What have you against him?' He had gleaned along the same furrows as I had. There was Murdoch's character and the mystery which seemed to hang around him. His furious burst of temper, as shown in the incident of the dog. The fact that he had quarrelled with Macpherson in the past, and that there was some reason to think that he might have resented his attentions to Miss Bellamy. He had all my points, but no fresh ones, save that Murdoch seemed to be making every preparation for departure. What would my position be if I let him slip away with all this evidence against him? The burly phlegmatic man was sorely troubled in his mind. Consider, I said, all the essential gaps in your case. On the morning of the crime, he can surely prove an alibi. He had been with his scholars till the last moment, and within a few minutes of Macpherson's appearance, he came upon us from behind. Then bear in mind the absolute impossibility that he could single-handed have inflicted this outrage upon a man quite as strong as himself. Finally, there is the question of the instrument with which these injuries were inflicted. What could it be but a scourge, or flexible whip of some sort? Have you examined the marks? I asked. I have seen them, so has the doctor, but I have examined them very carefully with a lens. They have peculiarities. What are they, Mr. Holmes? I stepped to my bureau and brought out an enlarged photograph. This is my method in such cases, I explained. You certainly do things thoroughly, Mr. Holmes. I should hardly be what I am if I did not. Now let us consider this wheel, which extends round the right shoulder. Do you observe nothing remarkable? I can't say I do. Surely it is evident that it is unequal in its intensity. There is a dot of extravasated blood here, and another there. There are similar indications in this other wheel down here. What can that mean? I have no idea. Have you? Perhaps I have. Perhaps I haven't. I may be able to say more soon. Anything which will define what made that mark will bring us a long way towards the criminal. It is, of course, an absurd idea, said the policeman. But if a red-hot net of wire had been laid across the back, then these better-marked points would represent where the meshes crossed each other. A most ingenious comparison or shall we say a very stiff cat o' nine tails with small hard knots upon it? By Jove, Mr. Holmes, I think you have hit it. Or there may be some very different cause, Mr. Bardell, but your case is far too weak for an arrest. Besides, we have those last words, lion's mane. I have wondered whether Ian... Yes, I have considered that, if the second word had any resemblance to Murdoch, but it did not. He gave it almost in a shriek. I am sure that it was Maine. Have you no alternative, Mr. Holmes? Perhaps I have, but I do not care to discuss it until there is something solid to discuss. And when will that be? In an hour, possibly less. The inspector rubbed his chin and looked at me with dubious eyes. I wish I could see what was in your mind, Mr. Holmes. Perhaps it's those fishing boats. No, no, they were too far out. Well, then, is it Bellamy and that big son of his? They were not too sweet upon Mr. McPherson. Could they have done him a mischief? No, no, you won't draw me until I am ready, said I with a smile. Now, Inspector, we have our own work to do. Perhaps if you were to meet me here at midday.